Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 31. The Python return statement is such a fundamental part of writing functions. Is it possible you missed some best practices when writing your own return statements? This week on the show, David Amos returns with another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We also talk about functional programming again with an article on the Python map function and processing iterables without a loop. We cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including interactive data visualization with PyGal, everything you need to know about named tuples, PEP 638, syntactic macros, Python for kids, the new NVIDIA Jetson board, and a reinforcement learning project named Football. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, David. Welcome back. Hey, Chris. Yeah, it's good to be back again. We're going to dive into a variety of articles again. Uh, I was going to start off this week. I have, I think I've mentioned multiple times that I'm into data visualizations and this one came up in PyCoders and I was like, oh, this looks really cool. It's titled Interactive Data Visualizations in Python with PyGal. And I had not heard of this library. It's on the Towards Data Science Medium blog. This particular one is by Sarah Metwali. It's talking about creating these, not only visualizations, but one of my favorite things, especially if anybody's looked at my bokeh course, is I really like interactive graphs and charts, stuff where you can filter stuff out or you know remove parts of the data and in, in showing it. And this library looks like it does a really good job of that. And then it has a really unique sort of feature to it that I was kind of surprised by. It exports SVGs. And I, I've seen SVGs, which are the scalable vector graphics, and they're great because it like anything vector, the resolution can be scaled up and down and they print really nice. You don't get that kind of blocky raster kind of thing that you might have to deal with, especially with like, you know, computers today, everything's like switching to retina type displays, double times displays and things like that. And the idea of something that can kind of go across that, that's described by text, you know, that can be scaled in any graphics is Mm -hmm. very intriguing to me. And then what I didn't know a lot about SVGs is that they can be interactive, that you can have a thing where as you hover your mouse over it, it'll highlight, maybe it's a a map or an area of a graph and can then do the hover showing values inside of it. But then also you can kind of click on different entries, say in a a list of things in a graph. And so it's, it's a neat library. One concern I have about it is that it is a little old it looks like the, most of the main updates to it were done in 2016 or 2017. So I'm not sure what the status is right now of the project, but maybe this renewed focus will get some more attention on it. I like how it looks. It, it definitely has a lot of the, you know, all the standard bar charts and maps, tree maps, which I'm not that familiar with doing. The article goes into taking data, very popular at this time of COVID data and and kind of spreading it out across, in this case, counties in different states and and showing the different data. You know, if you're interested in data visualizations and you're looking at uh, possibly different ways that you could present it, the idea of being able to export out these SVGs and be able to embed them maybe in a Flask application or Django or just being able to, you know, embed them just within HTML is pretty powerful. And so I definitely think it's worth checking out. Um, they go through, you know, everything, like I was mentioning, pie charts. They do this thing called, a, you know, the gauge charts that are sort of a donut shape. And then lots of styling. Yeah. Yeah. With lots of colors. And it's definitely worth checking out as another potential graphing library. And then I'm really excited about the idea of additional ways of saving the graphs as these SVG files. Because I think that could help with the not only the interactivity, but also just the idea that it can kind of scale to whatever kind of display or div or whatever you stick it into. Yeah. The, it was so unique. This is one of the reasons I wanted to feature this article in, in PyCoders. Yeah. Because of this idea of these interactive SVGs, I hadn't explored at all. I was kind of surprised that you could even do it. Although 
I mean, in retrospect, it's like, it's not that surprising once you sort of like peel apart the way SVGs work and everything. But yeah. Yeah. It just seems like a, she says at the beginning of the article, you know, it just gets overlooked this PyGal when people talk about plotting libraries. And, you know, I think the fact that it hasn't been maintained in a while, the, I'm looking at the GitHub right now, the last push to master, I don't know about the latest release, but the the last push to master was July 17th, 2018. So yeah. Okay. Over two years ago. Yeah. And I don't even know if that's like, you know, if that's whatever that was, was in a release that latest release that's like on PyPI might be even older. So that is one reason, you know, you may not want to use it, especially in something that like heavily relies on, you know, that's like running in production and relies on code that's going to be secure and well-maintained and everything. Yeah. It makes me think about all the all the things of coming out with Python 3.9 and right. all this idea of making your code maintainable and updated and so forth. Yeah. But it looks like a really cool library and maybe, you know, someone will be inspired to maybe help out and, and see if it's worth uh, kind of dusting off and <laughs> yeah. getting back uh, up to speed. So yeah, it's definitely a cool thing. And I, I too had never seen the, the needle charts. I thought those were pretty... Uh, yeah, pretty interesting. Really interesting. <laughs> Looks like a gauge, like on on like your car or, or something, right? Like, uh, right, right. I think that's the point. I think that's how you might might yeah. use it, or or a clock, or or something. But yeah, right. Yeah, it's a little different in that sense. But yeah, good stuff. So, what do you got first? First one I've got is an article about the map function from Real Python. It's by Leodanis Pozo Ramos, which we featured several of his articles on this on this podcast now. And I think there'll be even more coming up in the future. So, <laughs> but the article is called Python's Map Processing Iterables Without a Loop. So it's a very thorough article, which most of his uh, are very thorough. And it talks about how you use the map function. And uh, it gets into even some really interesting things. So he talks about, you know, this map function, to, to I guess to sum it up, you know, it it allows you to process and transform items in an iterable without using like a for loop. So you pass the iterable and some function that that you that gets applied to every item in the iterable to the map function and it returns a new iterable with that function applied to each item. So it's it's like a transformation and you don't have to write a loop to do it. That's I guess one of the draws to it. It's one of the tools that helps support like a functional programming style which we've talked a little bit about. Yep. Before. We dove into that before, yeah. <laughs> One of the nice things about this article is it kind of gives you, really gives you a lot of context as to like how this fits in to the standard library, why it's there, and why, you know, it, you might use it or not use it, what the alternatives are. So it's really a very comprehensive guide. He talks about how Guido had never really, Guido's not, I don't think, a big fan. I don't know this for a fact, but just like kind of anecdotal evidence and things I've read seem to kind of, point to like Guido not being a huge fan of maybe the functional programming style. And, you know, he's got this quote that he, he says, I've never considered Python to be heavily influenced by functional languages, no matter what people say or think. I was much more familiar with imperative languages such as C and Algol 68. And although I had made functions first class objects, I didn't view Python as a functional programming language. But back in 1993, the Python community started kind of demanding some functional programming features. So you got things like the Lambda, you got the map function, the filter function, the reduce function. Leodanis does a good job of providing this context to kind of, you know, have it help you understand why this is there and then, then how to get started with it. So it covers just the basics of using the map function, understanding how it works and kind of comparing it to for loops and everything. So you kind of see what's, I guess a way to think about how map works in terms of your like the the for loop, which is a good way to to kind of think about it. But he gets into some other stuff. So he talks about a, a version of map that exists in the iter tools package, which is one of my favorite packages in the in the standard library, and that's called the star map function, which is similar to similar to map, but that when you call the function on on an item in the iterable, it applies the unpacking operator. So if you have like an iterable of iterables, 
right? So like a list of lists or something. Sure. Okay. Then, and you have a function that takes multiple arguments. So basically what you do is when that function gets applied to the, an item in the iterable, which is a list, then uh, the star operator, the unpacking operator gets applied and each item in that list gets becomes like one of the arguments of the function. So in one of the limitations of the standard map function is that the function that you pass to map has to be like, it has to take a single parameter or have a single parameter because whatever the item is in the iterable just gets passed to that function as an argument. So if the function expects more than one argument, you're going to get an error. The star map though, you can have a function that takes multiple arguments and use it in the same thing. So that's kind of the, the difference there. So he talks about star map, and then he talks about things like list comprehensions and generator expressions and how you can achieve the same results as you would with map using these other constructs. And they may be considered maybe more Pythonic. They might might be easier to read. That's, you know, an opinion. But he just gives you the whole gamut of of kind of everything out there on, on map. So it's very thorough and very well written. Uh, lots of great information in it. Yeah, cool. I, I got to talk to him the other day yeah. from Cuba, which is very cool. And so we talked a little bit about his background coming from being, you know, working in petroleum and being a mechanical engineer. And it's interesting because he has a similar background to me in some ways that he's very self-taught, it's just sort of bootstrapped his way into Python. This has a really been a fantastic way for him to not only research these topics that he's covering in these articles, but also just to like, you know, learn in that process by like, you know, fanning out and looking at all the different ways that you could kind of go into that. So, which has been, I mean, it's been fantastic for us. So (laughs) at Real Python. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing, just, you know, Laodonis, if you're you're listening, I mean, I'm just going to throw this out there because I I talked with him too as well. And and he has been learning English, I guess, for like about a decade, but has never really gotten a lot of practice speaking or writing English, I guess, before he started writing for Real Python, which is mind boggling to me because <laughs> right. he's a really great writer. So that's, uh, I mean, that's amazing. So great job on that, Leodonis. <laughs> you're, you're writing great English. It's awesome. Yeah. I want to explore this article more and, and kind of look at, I don't know, anything to do with iterables has kind of been in a thing that I've been focusing on a little bit in my programming. To like, like you said, like additional ways to kind of create iterables and then then look at the different types of uh, collections and kind of tie it all together. Yeah, for sure. So my next one is kind of a callback a little bit to a topic that I talked about. I was mentioning Dan's article about common Python data structures. And one of the ones that we kind of passed through as we're going through this massive list of all the different types were not only the data class that came along in, or data classes that came along in Python 3.7, but also the collections named tuple Mm -hmm. uh, or named tuple and some of the advantages to that. And so when I saw this article, I was like, okay, I want to dive more into that. And the article is called Everything You Need to Know About Python's Named Tuples. And it's by Miguel Brito. I guess it's called Miguendez, Miguendez's blog, (laughs) if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Kind of just dives into the idea of like, okay, well, why would you want to use these? What's what are advantages to them? And kind of does this real contrast between creating data in dictionaries and why a name tuple would be advantageous in that sense. They're created in a kind of a funky way. Like a lot of people may know that when you are putting things into a function that what's being put in is usually a a tuple, you know, even though it might be a single item, you know, all those different arguments that are going in inside the parentheses. And also what is returned is typically a tuple. But what this will do is create this new sort of object that in some ways it kind of feels a little bit like a class, the way that you kind of create them. Mm -hmm. So you import it in from the collections module. And then from there you do something like, okay, you know, car equals name tuple parentheses. And then, Instead of like having to say the way you would define a class or define a function, you just simply put in a single text string for kind of what the name tuple, you kind of almost repeat the name is a very common method of, you know, applying this. And then the next parameter you put in there is 
you know, all the names of the things that you want to do. And that's usually like a text string. In this car example, it could be color, space, mileage, space, automatic, you know, inside of a pair of quotation mark. And then when you go to create the cars, like car one, you'd say, okay, car one equals car. And then you simply pass in the three different values that you want in there. So if it was color, you'd say, okay, red, comma, and then the mileage, whatever the current mileage is, is like a float. And then on, if it's automatic or not automatic, you put like, say, true. Mm-hmm. And so that creates this object. And what's nice is that it has that notation, that dot notation that you'd be used to with a, a class. So you can, you can get to those values by saying, okay, car one dot color. And it actually would then, in this case, show the value that it's red or, you know, if you said mileage or what have you. But you can still use indexing if you want, but indexing, you know, it's, it's harder for people to to read and see that. So in some ways, it feels like a class. Now, here's where it's really different, though, right, is that the fact that it you can get to those values, but you can't set them, right? So they're, it's an immutable object. You can basically create them, but they're going to be interchangeable. And another nice advantage is that the size of them, they're small, right? They're very much like a tuple as far as if you use the uh, get size of mm-hmm. to to look at the different values, you'd see that they, as far as memory management, they're going to be about the same as a tuple, which is great. And another advantage or disadvantage, depending on how you want to look at it, is that they're hashable, unlike a dictionary. Right. So, so there, there's a whole bunch of different advantages that kind of goes into here. And then he goes into how could you have these behave with dictionaries? How can you unpack values coming back and forth between them, creating them, uh, sorting the tuples? If you wanted to take a group of name tuples, how could you serialize them into JSON? And, and then some kind of interesting things like to, to make them you know, even feel a little more like a class, like this, this idea of adding a doc string to it. And so it's a neat article kind of diving into uh, you know some of deeper things that you may be interested in being able to do with this behind the curtain tool you know a lot of people may not know about them but you know the more that i see them in use i'm like oh these are, could be really really powerful and then we've been talking a lot about optimizing code you know things like for data science and so forth the idea of having something that like this that could potentially replace a dictionary and have a smaller footprint and not necessarily have the you know issues that you might have with dictionaries the mutability and so forth could be you know really powerful so i I don't know. It's a good article. It builds on top of the stuff that we covered in Dan's article previously. Yeah. One of the things I really like about this article is that it has a whole section on the differences between name tuples and data classes, which I think is a really, you know, if you're going to have a complete article on name tuples, you have to include this because it's, there's, I guess the sentiment I've seen uh, coming from some people in, on Twitter and in some comments that I've seen on on articles that they kind of feel like with the introduction of data classes in 3.7, name tuples are obsolete. And that is absolutely not the case. There's a very big difference between name tuples and data classes, and that is immutable structure versus mutable structure. Right. And it kind of comes down to the difference between like a tuple and a dictionary in, in, a, in a lot of ways. So, so I don't think that name tuples are obsolete at all. In fact, the, the whole tuple versus dictionary thing is actually a very relevant comparison in my mind because you know you don't say that tuples are obsolete because we have dictionaries <laughs> right so uh they're serving you know kind of different different purposes and i think you know the the fact that you get a, a immutable and hashable data structure out of a name tuple is really advantageous in certain situations the fact that they have a smaller memory footprint they're based on code written in c instead of pure python right so the speed thing again yeah so there's like some speed advantages which, you know, on an individual basis, isn't, it's not like you're getting mega differences between those, those two things, right? But if you're having to process millions of items... Right. That's always what it comes to, right? <laughs> it could, you know, it could mean quite a large difference in the performance of your, of your program. So, so, yeah, it's just something to keep in mind that uh, think about if, if you're using a data class, which I think in many instances you should, you might want to consider using a name tuple instead if you need some of the advantages that name tuples provide. So, and that hashing and immutability kind of being the key, key thing there. Right. So what's your next one? Uh, next thing on my list is a new pep 
that is still in draft mode or draft status. Okay. It was created September 24th this year, so it's very new still, by authored by Mark Shannon. And it's uh, the number is 638, and it's called Syntactic Macros. And this, you know, I have no idea. I didn't actually have time, unfortunately, to sort of, I want to dig into some of the debate that maybe has been sprung up around this and kind of look at the mailing list and just see what the discussion going on there was. But I imagine there's a lot of discussion going on because it's a very interesting pep in that what it aims to do is support something called a syntactic macro for Python. So I'm going to read the description from the pep here from its abstract. A macro is a compile time function that transforms a part of the program to allow functionality that cannot be expressed cleanly in normal library code. The term syntactic means that this sort of macro operates on the program's syntax tree. This reduces the chance of mistranslation that can happen with text-based substitution macros and allows the implementation of hygienic macros. Oh. So there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah. I, I, we won't get into all those details. Here's kind of the main summary. Syntactic macros allow libraries to modify the abstract syntax tree during compilation, providing the ability to extend the language for specific domains without adding to complexity to the language as a whole. So I guess in more layman's terms, what this means is you can create a macro that introduces new syntax to Python once it's been compiled to bytecode. Mm and then use that syntax in your program. So the whole deal with, uh, say, the walrus operator, there, it was a, kind of a big controversy right. uh, around all that. In fact, it led to uh, basically of Guido stepping down as as a, sort of the sole decision maker for all that, and we now have the steering council, right? I mean, it led to pretty dramatic changes in the organization of how how decisions get made for the Python language. So... What this is introducing is this would say, hey, instead of adding something like the walrus operator to the language itself, let's make it a macro that you could use if you want, right? It would be an optional thing. You'd, you'd download some, you'd install some third-party library and import that syntax, basically import something that would allow you then to use that syntax. And then once you ran your program, that would be compiled and that syntax would become valid for that program. You'd be able to, uh, to run it. It's a really interesting idea because there is a very compelling argument to not wanting to introduce new complexity to the language. And that's what these things like the Walrus operator, things like uh, this match yeah. statement, where I think it's six PEP 622 that we've talked about. All these things introduce new complexity to the language that doesn't exist already. And that new complexity can cause issues that aren't easily foreseen. So, which is why you have you know, alpha and beta releases and things get tested and yeah. you try to get all these, uh, get a bunch of things tested before you go into production. But there's not always enough time to do that. And so he points to a couple of issues with, let me see if I can find it here, with, I think it was the with statement. So there, there were some things, I believe it was the with statement, that when it was introduced, it had some bugs, some pretty serious bugs that took time to iron out because they didn't really have the time to appropriately, I guess, vet that stuff and test it before it went into the language. So with a macro, you'd be able to test that without actually changing the language at all. You'd be able to put it out there, you'd be able to prototype this stuff, make it really easy for people to, you know, rather than having to like create a custom version of CPython to test out some new syntax, you just install this macro and uh, and be able to test it out. And then if, you know, it was stable enough and a lot of people liked it, then you could have the discussion, I guess, of should we add it to the to the language? So that's one use case. Another kind of the main use case that, that Mark Shannon points out is for this is domain-specific macros. So there's certain patterns that might make a lot of sense for certain domains, like maybe in scientific computing or data processing, that don't make a lot of sense in something like web development. Right. Or something like that. So rather than, I guess, catering to a subset of the users and introducing new complexity on behalf, on their behalf, and you might introduce a bug that affects people in other user groups, 
then you know this macro idea might make a lot of sense. And then they can sort of have their own domain-specific macros that they use and love and it works for them, but they don't have to add that additional complexity to the language itself. So it's a really fascinating pep, and I'm very curious to see where all this goes from here. Yeah, a couple things on that. One, when I had Russell, Keith McGee on, mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about the the size of Python, right? Yeah, the actual things and the, the whole idea of, of the batteries included kind of model. Right. And he, he, his statement was, and again, I'm fairly new to the community, but I guess this is a thing that's kind of out there that people say, well, some of those batteries are leaking pretty badly. Right. And so the idea of adding all these additional features, and the other thing that we talked about last week on the Python 3.9 episode was this idea of a first party library, which I guess this would kind of be in that mode, maybe somewhat the idea of the, that you'd be adding these things in to your setup. If you're, maybe you're going to do stuff with right. like a circuit Python, or like you said, like, you know, data science or what have you, they talk about this idea of it being just, you know, it's fully backwards compatible, mm -hmm. which is interesting too. the idea that you can kind of like structure things in that way. So yeah. It's one to watch. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, for sure. I'm just really curious to see where all this goes. I, I I really like the idea. It makes a lot of sense to me. So, you know, I'm I'm kind of for it at, at this point, just based on reading the pep and kind of thinking about it. But like I said, I haven't had time to really dig into any of the debates that are going on around it and kind of see what uh what the other viewpoints are and what the other arguments are maybe against it. So Right, right. <laughs> keep an eye on it and see how it goes. <laughs> this week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's called Command Line Interfaces in Python. It's based on a real Python article by Andre Burgode. In the course, instructor Liam Pulsifer explains the details behind implementing your own command line interfaces in Python and how they can process a variety of arguments. In the video course, you'll learn about the origins of Python command line arguments, the standards guiding the design of a CLI, the basics to manually customize and handle Python command line arguments, and you'll learn about libraries available in Python and third parties to ease the development of a complex CLI of your own. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how to implement your own command line interface and how to handle a variety of arguments to make them flexible and more useful to the users of your Python projects. Like most of the video courses on Real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections and it includes code samples for the techniques shown. This course also includes a shiny new transcript and closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. Guess who my next one's from? <laughs> it's another Real Python article, and Leah Danis has been on a roll. And so he uh, has this one called the Python Return Statement. Uh, usage and best practices. And this is a real deep dive. You know, it, it starts out with what's a function and the idea of a return statement inside of a function and the idea that right. even if you make a function that doesn't have a return statement, it's still returning none. <laughs> it's, it's returning something. It's returning, the you know, a none value. And, you know, so it goes through that whole, those sort of fundamentals, but really sort of explaining what's happening as you're going along and really unpacking a lot of these concepts like returning versus printing yeah uh, the idea of returning multiple values and then it has this whole best practices section that i think is, is excellent should you return none explicitly do you you know a lot of people may feel like well i don't need to you know and the idea of readability inside of that the idea of avoiding sort of complex expressions the way that it may be useful to break things down because you can have like a whole huge expression mm -hmm. after you say return, you know, you could have this very long list comprehension or what have you, some kind of very compound statement that that's after that. And it you know, may make sense that inside of your return, well, inside of your function to have a lot of that stuff sort of defined above. So it just right. add that readability and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like it's into testability and maintainability and stuff, but yeah. Yeah, right. Well, that and uh, the other thing he mentioned, which is the idea of debugging, which I, I still want to get somebody on to talk mm -hmm. in a deep level about debugging. But the idea that, you know, stepping through your code and being able to check your values as you go. Right. That's hard to do with a, com you know, a compound, you know, elaborate right. exactly. expression <laughs> at that point. So, so advantages there. And then 
using conditionals, uh, having multiple steps as you're kind of going through, you know, with you know, as you walk through the return statement can be kind of short circuited and you know, leaving the function kind of early um, as it hits these different things as you're walking through, working with true and false, recognizing dead code. That's something I talked with uh, Savannah about, which was a kind of neat feature of PyLance, the idea that it can kind of look through your code and see, like, if you have a return statement early on, right? you know, <laughs> things can be analyzed to say, yeah, this never runs, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then returning multiple things, which I think I said, but this one actually uses a, an example of returning multiple named objects and then comes back to the name tuple again, which is kind of cool, and how that you could use that to define things coming out of it and then have all those nice, you know, not only the values, but the actual, you know, yeah. names of what the values are inside of it, which is a useful structure. And then a couple of things that have been kind of foggy in my own learning, uh, these areas that, that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, CS sort of <laughs> jargon yeah. that gets thrown around. And one of them for me was, was closures. Like it, it wasn't very clear to me what that is. And this really, cleared up a lot of what what that means and how that how that works you know there's a lot of object oriented kind of stuff happening inside there also so the factory pattern you know the idea that an object can create other objects so in this case you know you could have a, a function that literally returns functions or potentially could be returning you know lots of different objects of different types so an example would be like a shape generator and you can you know what do you want it to generate? You know, do you want it to create a square or a circle and calling those different things out of there, which is pretty powerful. And then, mm -hmm. you know, how you can, how return sort of works inside of try and finally blocks. And then finally, you know, kind of goes into decorators and then uh, the idea of, you know, how generator functions can work and it's sort of returning each time it's calling those uh, next values, which is cool. It, like most of his articles, is very, very thorough. You might think to yourself, oh, as I read this first half of it, I know all this. Well, it has to be covered <laughs> in order to, to really explain the things that are happening in the second half of it, which is right. really diving into some of these things that might be a little fuzzy, especially for intermediate developers. So I really like that about it. Uh, again, I I think he's using it in a way to to help him you know, clarify things in his mind and, and, and clarify it for our readers and people enjoying the, the site. Yeah, it's, um, it, this is, I think, a really good article. And, you know, I was kind of surprised when, when I saw it coming down the pipeline, it's like the return statement, you know, thinking like, what would I, you know, what would I expect to see in that article? <laughs> what do you have to add? <laughs> and when I saw the outline and everything, it was like, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is going a lot deeper than I kind of expected. But the more I think about it, the more I was like, you know, this, this is actually, highly valuable because there's a lot of especially for self-taught programmers because yeah there's so many subtleties that exist in all this stuff that you know i'm not even sure many cs students really fully grasp this because of this stuff when they go through like a cs program because you learn about a lot of these things right but i don't know that it necessarily sticks uh with everyone all of it at the same time too right you know <laughs> right exactly so this is really you know you probably, if you learned how to write a function and return a value, then, you know, you know, probably 70 to 80% of what you need to know about the return statement just to write Python on a daily basis, right? But there's all these subtle things that can kind of occur. And so it's just really good to see something like this that really breaks it down, explains it very clearly, and is not, you know, unafraid to go into that level of depth. And the best practices section is one of my favorite parts of it. And that was, I was just really glad to see, because I think there is a lot of confusion. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of, you just don't know, like when you're, when you're self-taught, like, should I, like, like this whole thing of like, should I return a value, like none explicitly or not? Like, does it matter? Right. And no one really answers that for you. Should I write big complex expressions, you know, even if it's like a one liner or should I, is split it up. I mean, there's all these things and uh, you might not be thinking about like, you know, how easy is it to de debug that? So I'm really happy that this is out there and on real Python. And I hope that people read it and really uh, get a lot out of it. I think they will. Yeah. So what's your next one? Uh, my next one is kind of fun. It's uh, it's called Python for kids and it's a, 
It's a GitHub repo that is a collection of basically links to articles that this this guy, Kevin Thomas, has written on LinkedIn. Okay. And the repo contains code samples and things like that that, that complement the, the articles that he wrote on LinkedIn. And since we featured this on PyCoders, there's been some pretty big changes to it that I've, I just saw when I brought it up today. So when we featured this, he had only up to, I think, lesson eight out of 10 lessons that he was planning. And he's now completed those 10 lessons and then now started a whole new section on like an intermediate course continuing on. So he's now up to lesson 14. Oh, nice. And these are specifically targeted towards kids. And he doesn't say what age it's for, but I would guess that, you know, it's sort of that middle school, high school age. Yeah. It's all focused around Python for microcontrollers. So uh, specifically, specifically the BBC micro bit, and I guess in the intermediate stuff, he's using an expressive ESP32 development board. It's very hands-on and, you know, introducing Python, but also with being able to make sounds and make, you know, little robots and just, you know, stuff that kids might need to help keep their attention. Cause it's like, when you're able to type in some code and see a light go off or see something like physically move that, I mean, even for adults, it's really exciting. I don't know. Just that first time, right. like you just, it's like, oh man, that, that the servo is actually, you know, spinning and like the wheels turning and, ah, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's, they're, they're really well-written articles and it's, it's a, just a really nice collection, kind of everything all in one spot. And like I said, I'm just kind of surprised. I didn't realize that there was going to be an intermediate course here. So there's even now more, it, it all uses the Moo debugger or Mu not debugger, uh, the Mu editor. Yeah. <laughs> the IDE. IDE, yeah. whatever you want to call it. And, um, Very simple IDE, which is great. It is, yeah. Mu is, is really nice. And, you know, one of, the, one of the advantages of Mu is it comes with Python 3. So when you download Mu, it just comes with Python. So it simplifies the install a lot, you know, just to like go ahead and get started. And uh, it also has a bunch of uh, sort of built-in features to connect to these microcontrollers and, and things like that. So it simplifies that process as well. So if you want, it really is a great way to kind of just get started for a complete beginner uh, because it kind of cuts out a lot of the, the frustrating bits that might might cause people to kind of give up prematurely on, on that end. So yeah, it's just a really fun series. You know, if you if you have children that are interested or if you teach programming for children, it, this, it has tons of resources for you to to use and, and look at. So definitely check it out. I was trying to think like what's the best way to get a micro bit. Looks like microbit.org you can get like an educational package with it. And I was trying to see like you can get them from Adafruit. Okay, Adafruit has them them also. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Nice. Okay. Well that kind of moves us into the project area. Yeah. And I have a project, but it's more of yeah, it's kind of an article that features some hardware in it, and I, I think I'm more interested in the hardware. Yeah, because um, I had never heard of it. <laughs> uh, it was very new to me. Um, so it's a an article on Medium by Adam Gatege. The article's name: Build a Face Recognition System for sixty dollars with a new NVIDIA Jetson Nano, two gigabyte, and Python. Now, the sixty dollars I don't think is correct because that's the price of the board. Right. But, you know, the other things you need with it, you need, like, batteries, and you, uh, you need a camera, and that I think the camera itself is more than that, but um, <laughs> depending on the quality of the camera. But the, the board is super interesting. So I didn't know NVIDIA made these. I think they are fairly new, but... They are brand new. Uh, it's Yeah, this, yeah, model, well, this is, yeah. model is, right? Yeah. The idea is, if you can think of something we've talked about <laughs> multiple times, I think, already, which is a Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. just, you know, this small, I guess we call it a microcomputer, what have you, but it's a full functioning computer and since you can plug a keyboard mouse plug in the display it has like you know ethernet and so forth okay well what makes this different well a huge <laughs> heat sink should like, give you an idea right away it has this gigantic heat sink that's sitting on top of it that probably weighs way more than the board itself uh because it has a gpu as the nvidia maxwell gpu built into it and the idea of getting gpu power should be pretty exciting for people that are interested in, okay, I want to do more with Python and data science with this and maybe potentially do something like facial recognition 
or you know whatever learning or you know all those kinds of things that that require more than what say the stock processor that comes with a, a raspberry pi would would allow things where you can do more you know scientific type of experimentations that can rely on the gpu inside of it and so this thing has come along and at 59 dollars you know, I'm super interested in getting one. It's on like pre-order and we'll definitely include links for, for that. And there's a whole bunch of additional projects uh, that NVIDIA allows on it. And it behaves very similar to a Raspberry Pi in the sense that you install an entire operating system and you put it on a, a small SD chip, one of those micro SD cards. Mm-hmm. And so once you've unpacked that using your computer to the little card, you insert the card right underneath that big old heat sink and it you know boots up like a little computer. and then you can instruct it. You can. It has a, a version of Linux on it, and you can you know use a bunch of tools. And that's where this article is great: is that it goes through diving into not only assembling the system, but just like okay, well, what are the the kinds of commands you, you need to get just started and getting uh, you know like a Python like environment going on it, so you can car- kind of start playing with it. And so this whole thing goes into like okay, adding a Raspberry Pi. I'm guessing that's a company. I'm I'm confused on that, but they have introduced a, a camera module and it's been through a few revisions, but they have an, a fairly recent new revision of it. I think it's like version 2.x or whatever that can attach to the board. It's like as an accessory that's, you know, pretty powerful camera. It's not small either. <laughs> it's actually kind of a large looking little device, but attaching that camera to it and then, you know, going through this whole process of, of creating it. And then you know, beyond getting the Python code up and running on this device, the end of the article really dives into like, okay, how do you make it standalone? And so you might need a, a, an HDMI little display. Uh, you're going to need some kind of battery power potentially, or some kind of other way of remotely powering it. Anyway, so it kind of goes through the whole walkthrough and code on GitHub that you can kind of work with and adapt to your uses. But uh, again, the NVIDIA site has a whole bunch of other additional projects and examples of stuff, everything from, you know, doing audio to, you know, little robots uh, they have a thing called the JetBot, <laughs> which I think is a kit um, for doing a lot of the stuff with it. So anyway, I just didn't know about this hardware, and it intrigues me. And definitely, if you're in the Python space and you want to do even more advanced kind of AI or things that would take advantage of a GPU, uh, I would definitely look into this. What, what kind of project you got this week? So this week I've got, it's not a very new project. As far as I can tell, it's like a year and a quarter old maybe a year and a few months oh, okay but i i had just heard about it it's it's from google it's called google research football and i was you know it came up as like i think one of the trending projects uh python projects on github and so i just was like what is what is this so look into it it's really cool it's all about reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning is used to train like an ai that can interact with like an environment it can solve complex tasks and it can you know, work with like real world applications like robotics, like self driving cars uses that's like all reinforcement learning. They've been used to do things like uh, learn to play console games, learn to play Go, chess, you know, all these things, and, you know, get good enough that they can actually beat some of the best masters we have of these types of games. So this is a, a research environment for reinforcement learning that is based on the world's most popular sport football or soccer if if you're american the football where you actually use your foot that's it, right, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> it's modeled after like uh, i mean it looks like like the like the fifa game you would play on like xbox or something it's uh it's a very complex 3d environment it, it provides this whole engine for you to use to to train agents to uh to learn to play football and it's it's just incredible. I mean, it's beautiful graphics. Yeah, it looks like it uses Pygame and SDL. It's uh yeah, it's all Ooh. written in in Python. And you know, I'm looking at so there's the uh, the GitHub repo that's got a bunch of information, and then at the top of their README, they've got links to things like the game server and uh, a blog post that's actually got like pictures and stuff within it. But yeah, they're um, let's take a peek in there. Oh, do they not have a requirements? Maybe in their setup Pi. Yeah, they're using Pi Game, OpenCV, and SciPy, and something called Jim. Huh, never heard of Jim before. 
GYM, yeah, a tool fit, toolkit for oh for for developing and comparing reinforcement learning algorithms. There you go. Yeah, so it's um, I think it's is it a hundred percent Python? Oh, it's on the side here. Seventy two point seven percent Python, twenty five point five percent Jupyter Notebook. So it's like basically all all Python, which is kind of crazy because if you look at the pictures and from the blog post, I mean, this is it's a, it's just like I'd never seen a Pi game <laughs> a game look like that. It's really good. So really cool. Yeah. So if you like soccer and are interested in uh, reinforcement learning, this looks like a really cool way to kind of combine those two interests and, and have a lot of fun working with that. Nice. Yeah. It kind of ties in a whole bunch of stuff there. And I haven't talked about gaming a whole lot in the last several months, but I'm intrigued to kind of dive back into that. And I have some guests in mind that hopefully I could get onto the, that'd be fun on the show to, dive a little bit deeper into that and this would be kind of a cool project to explore yeah well that's great thanks for coming on the show and bringing all those articles again yeah thanks for having me all right talk to you soon david see ya i want to thank david amos for coming on the show this week and bringing along all those great articles and i want to thank you for listening to the real python podcast make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player and if you like the show leave us a five-star rating and a review You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and look forward to talking to you soon.